You are listening to a Clark's World magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. I hope this podcast finds you extraordinarily well. It's our last story for the month of July 2017, issue 130. There's not much news to report except that in just a few short days, we will be giving you a whole new month of brand new stories. So, if you like what you hear, tell me something that I want to hear, and that you have gone to patreon.com forward slash clarksworld and pledged your support with a dollar or more a month. It's less than a cup of coffee, and we really need the support. Our last story of the month is titled The Oracle. It is by Lavi Tidar. Lavi grew up on a kibbutz in Israel, has traveled widely in Africa and Asia, and has lived in London, the South Pacific island of Vanuatu and Laos. And after a spell in Tel Aviv, he is currently living back in England again. He is the winner of the 2003 Clark Bradbury Prize, awarded by the European Space Agency, was the editor of Michael Marshall Smith, the annotated bibliography, and the anthologies A Dick and Jane Primer for Adults, the three-volume The Apex Book of World SF series, and two anthologies edited with Rebecca Levine, Jews vs. Aliens and Jews vs. Zombies. His stories have appeared in Interzone, Asimov's, Clark's World Apex, Strange Horizons, Postscripts, Fantasy Magazine, and others, and have been translated into seven languages. His most recent book, is a big multifaceted SF novel, Central Station. If you want to find out more about Lavi, you can find him at his website, lavitidhar.wordpress.com. And we've got a couple of stories that he's been featured in in this magazine. October 2006 brought you 304 Adolf Hitler Strauss. April 2009 brought you The Dying World. February 2010 brought you The Language of the Whirlwind. 2011 brought you The Smell of Orange Groves, and March 2015 brought you The Bookseller. So I invite you to sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. There was a time of rains. They lashed the old hill and the cobbled market, driving traders under awnings, robotnik beggars into litter-strewn alcoves, revelers into bars and shisha-pipe emporiums. The smell of lamb fat slowly melting over rotating skewers of meat flavored the air, mixing with the sweetness of freshly baked baklava and the tang of cumin, and strong bitter coffee served with roasted cardamoms. This was an old, old Jaffa, amidst the arches and cobblestones, a stone throw from the sea. You could still smell the salt and the tar in the air, and watch at sunrise the swoop and turn of solar kites and their winged surfers in the air. But not in the rain, and not at night. The oracle's name had once been Cohen, and she was, it was true, related to St. Cohen of the others. This was rumored, but not widely confirmed. You were no doubt wondering about the children of Central Station, wondering, too, how a Strigoi was allowed to come to Earth. This is woman home, remember. This is the womb from which humanity crawled, tooth by bloody nail toward the stars. But it is an ancestral home, too, to the others, those children of digitality. In a way, this is their story. Once, the world was young. Palestine and Israel, those two entities overlapping each other both geographically and historically, were still unmerged. They were two conflicting histories, two warring stories, not yet unified into one narrative. It was before the return of the refugees, before the infamous Messiah murder, before the second Aliyah and the establishment of new Israel on Mars, 
before Jaffa became an Arab city again, separate from Jewish Tel Aviv, before Central Station became their buffer zone, the uncanny valley in which they met. It was a time when Jerusalem was still being ruled by the Jews, a time when computers could be seen and held, big clumsy things not yet spored. The conversation had already began, but it was halting, limited, its bandwidth capped, its reach terminating in Earth orbit. It was before we sent out spiders to seed the solar system, with hubs and nodes and gateways and mirrors, before the Chinese built lunar port, before the exodus ships and jettisoned, and the seedling of the belt with life. In that world, so unlike our own, this world of prehistory almost, when North America was still a power and old Europe slumbered, China hungered, India blossomed, and Brazil and Nigeria shot upwards like trees reaching for the sky. In that world and into the city of Jerusalem, there came a scientist. Historical dramas show him sometimes arriving like a gunslinger would. In the Phobos' studio production of The Rise of Others, Matt Cohen is played by Elvis Mandela, coming into Jerusalem on horseback in an intentional echo of the Messiah murder, though the Messiah had come in on the traditional white donkey. But that was fiction, which is to say, exaggeration. The truth is that Matt Cohen came by conventional, for the first time jet airplane into the old airport in Tel Aviv. This was before Central Station became the city's hub. And took a taxi to Jerusalem, riding high into the mountains with their twisting sharp turns. Nor was he alone. Two of his research team were with him, Balez and Firi, crammed uncomfortably into the back seat of the taxi with their bulky equipment. Matt sat in the front, next to the driver, an Arab man wearing fake Gucci sunglasses. Matt blinked in the glare of light. His pressed white shirt was crumpled from the flight, already beginning to stain with sweat from the hot Mediterranean climb he was unused to. He wished he had invested in a pair of sunglasses, fake or not, like the driver. In a way, coming here had been an act of last resort. But we're distracted. So easily like a child with a toy. Something cheap and shiny like a kaleidoscope. Turn it one way and see Matt Cohen. Turn it another and you see the birth of others. Another still and you see the oracle as she is or as she was. Life is a series of moments forever sliding out of your grasp. If you are human, from nothing to nothing, amen, amen. But for the others, recall is being. Moments exist in parallel, have existed, will exist. The life of others is permutations. It is a kaleidoscope forever turning and turning. The Oracle was born Ruth Cohen on the outskirts of Central Station near the border with Jewish Tel Aviv. She grew up on Levinsky by the spice market, with the deep reds of paprika and the bright yellow of turmeric and the startling purple of sumac coloring the days. She had never met her famous progenitor. This was before even Jean Vivet came to Central Station, for when he met her she was already the Oracle and no longer Ruth Cohen, who had been a girl and a woman before she became joined. She had been a part of the world before this was in the time when Central Station was still merely a bus station, if a giant one, when the Robotniks still fought in the wars and were not yet discarded to beg for spare parts. Ruth never knew her famous progenitor. Have you already said that? Memory for us exists in a numinosity of potentials. He was her grandmother's grandfather, having met a Jewish girl in Jerusalem in the days of the emergence and got her with child, as they once said. Matt Cohen never died, you know. Or perhaps he did, and knew Matt Cohen's were fashioned out of the workshop of Sangorsky and Sutcliffe, the famous makers of Simulacra. Certainly people have claimed to meet him centuries later. Perhaps it was true, too, that he was of the first humans to be translated into the conversation, 
there to reside in the cores of the others, those heavily guarded vast quantum processors deep in the earth and scattered in solar space. He had passed like Jesus or Elron or Ago, from the realm of the living into the world of myth, and there remained for as long as human memory remains, a myth imago forever half remembered. The truth was that Matt had a headache. The taxi deposited them on the outskirt of the old city and left them there with their luggage in the approaching dusk. Church bells mixed with the call of mosques. Orthodox Jews clad in black walked past arguing intensely. It was cooler up in the mountains. Matt was grateful for that at least. So, Fieri said. So, Matt said. This is it, Balaz said. They looked at each other, these three disparate men, wary after the long fight and the moving from country to country, lab to lab, sometimes in the dead of night, in a hurry, sometimes leaving notes and equipment behind, sometimes one step ahead of irate landlords or other creditors or even the law. They had not been popular, these men. Their research considered both a dead end and immoral, for they sought to Frankenstein, to breed life in their closed networks the way a biologist may breed tadpoles and watch them become frogs. They had the tadpoles, but as yet they had not turned into either frogs or princesses. They continued to exist only in potentia. Now they checked in into the small hostel that would be their temporary headquarters until they could once again set up shop. The servers rested silent in their coolers, their codes suspended, not living, not dead. Matt's fingers itched to plug them in, to boot them up, to run them, to let the wild code inside mutate and fuck, split and merge and split and merge, lines of code entwining and branching, growing ever more complex and aware. A breeding grounds. The breeding grounds, as we'd later known them. Capitalized and all. The evolutionary track from which others emerged. There is a poetry to evolution. Old tree. Oli. Coco. Coco. Ol beot. Wrote the poet Bashu. All the trees go, go. Go, go, everywhere. The trees he wrote of were binary trees. Lior Tiroche, in apocryphal manuscript on the history of the breeding grounds, wrote in somewhat purple prose. Imagine a place. Here there are no boundaries of physical space. Time is measured in nanoseconds, processor cycles, in mips and bips, millions and billions of instructions per second. What space there is, is constructed. There is an imaginary geography of binary trees, a topography of evolving structures, and boundaries of population samples. The beat of a human heart means nothing in this place. Yet in the time it takes for the beat of such a heart to happen, these things drastically change. A small tribe of a so far unpromising structure suddenly shoots to prominence, its population multiplying rapidly, or a carefully instructed mutation suddenly causes a promising structure to dwindle and disappear. Evolution is enforced. In cycle after cycle of mating, mutation and finally selection, and structures combine, mutate, and die in the blink of a human eye. Akimwene, Miriam's brother, was obsessed with Tiroche's work, a poet and pulp writer who disappeared long before, but who, like St. Cohen of the others, kept reappearing through the centuries, here and there. Fakes, clones, hoaxes, rumors, the Elvis of book collectors. But this is by the by. Ruth Cohen, incidentally, went through a religious phase and attended a girl's yeshiva for a time in her teenage years. She had woken one night late, thunder streaked the sky. She blinked, 
trying to recall a dream she'd just had. She had been walking through the streets of Central Station and a storm raged where the station should have been, a whirlwind that stood still even as it moved. Ruth walked towards it, drawn to it. The air was hot and humid. The storm, silent, bore within itself people frozen like mannequins and bottles and a minibus with the wheels still turning and frozen faces inside glued to the windows. Ruth felt something within the storm an intelligence, a knowing something. Not human, but not hostile, either. Something other. She approached it. She was barefoot, and the asphalt was warm against the soles of her feet, and the storm opened its mouth and spoke to her. She lay in bed trying to recall the dream. Thunder woke her. What had the storm said? There had been a message there, something important, something deep and ancient, if only she could recall. She lay there for a long time before she fell back to sleep. The yeshiva had not been a huge success. Ruth wanted answers, needed to understand the voice of the storm. The rabbis seemed unwilling or unable to offer that, and so, for a time, Ruth tried drugs and sex and being young. She traveled to Thailand and Laos, and there studied the way of Agko, which is no way at all, and talked to monks and bar owners and full immersion denizens. There, in the city of Nongkai, on the banks of the Mekong River, she conked for the first time, transitioning from our own reality to the one of the guilds of Ashkelon universe, fully immersed, deep in the substrata of the conversation. That first time felt strange, the shell of the conch, the plastic hot, the smell of unwashed bodies who had been enmeshed inside it for too long. Then the immersion rig closing, the light gone, a cave as silent as a tomb. She was trapped, blind, helpless. And she transitioned. One moment she was blind and deaf. The next, she was standing in the bright sunlight of Sisavang III, in the lunar colony of the Guild of Cam. Impossibly tall buildings towered above her. Spaceships zipped through the air and in the moon's orbit while creatures of all kinds and shapes walked around. For Guilds of Ashkelon was the greatest and oldest of the game's world's virtualities, a place more real, it was sometimes said, than reality itself. Ruth joined the Guild of Cam as a low-ranking member, spending all her remaining bot on hours of immersion. She joined the crew of a starship, the Fermi Paradox, and traveled the nearby sector, exploring ancient alien ruins, encountering new species of alien games life, trading, warring, sometimes pirating, converting games' world credit into real-world cash, her skin becoming brittle and pale from the long immersion in the coffin-like pod. But still, she did not find whatever it was she was looking for. Only once, briefly, had she come close. She had found a holy object, a game's world talisman of great power. It was on a deserted moon in Omega Quadrant. She had come onto the surface of the moon alone. It was in a cave. The atmosphere was breathable. She did not have a helmet on. She knelt by the object and touched it, and a bright flame burst into life, and then she was in an elsewhere. A voice that was like the voice of the whirlwind in her dream spoke to her. It spoke direct into her mind, into her wired node. It enveloped her in warmth and love. It knew her. She did not recall what it had said or how it had said it. When she came through... She was back on her ship. The object inventoried her credits up by a thousand points, her health and strength and shielding maxed. She had been visited by a sysop, one of the rare, elusive others who ran the game's worlds in the background, seldom seen, always present. They were not gods. Only within the confines of the game did they have godly powers. But they were other, the only truly alien race in that entire universe, the others were either human players or NPCs, non-player characters randomly created. And suddenly she knew what she wanted. She wanted achingly and clearly to know more about others. 
The next day, she had left the guilds of Ashkelon universe. She emerged blinking and shaking into the sunlight. She sat by the river, her muscles weak, and drank thick coffee, sweetened with condensed milk. Two days later, she was in Bangkok, then aboard a solar wing plane back to Tel Aviv. It is inaccurate to say that the others were born in Jerusalem, that ancient city of faith and war. They evolved in the breeding grounds through countless cycles of mating and dying, if code can be said to mate and die. Yet we do, just as they did, our billions of neurons firing on-off signals across a wet wire network, suspended in cerebrospinal fluid, encased in the hardy bones of the skull. An illusion of an eye, a self-awareness, that they had emerged at last from infants to stumbling children in that Jerusalem lab was merely an accident of politics and finance. Matt Cohen and his team had moved across state lines in the United States, had gone to Europe for a time, sought refuge in Monaco and Liechtenstein, then offshore on lonely islands where the palm trees moved lazily in the breeze. The others could have emerged in Vanuatu or Saudi Arabia or Laos. Resistance to the research was concentrated and public, for to create life is to play God, as Dr. Frankenstein had found out to his cost. It's what Life magazine called him back in the day. Dr. Frankenstein, when all he wanted was to be left alone with his computers, knowing that he did not know what he was doing, that digital intelligence, those not yet born others, could not be designed, could not be programmed by those who wrongly use the term artificial intelligence. Matt was an evolutionary scientist, not a programmer. He did not know what form they would take when at last they emerged. Evolution alone would determine that, as Tiroche wrote. Think of it as a plain. Across its surface, populations live and die, merge and diversify. From above, for it is always easier to think of it that way. Mutations are introduced into the code, the handful of nature shifting bits, turning zeros into ones and vice versa. Now think of binary trees, each of these entities, for it is easy to anthropomorphize these data structures, is, in terms of this space, gigantic. The trees grow roots and branches, and the roots grow subroots, and the branches grow leaves, and the process is repeated over millions of evolutionary cycles, so that these entities become bloated with control structures and semi-autonomous decision-making routines, many of which appear not to have an obvious purpose. Design is impossible at this level of complexity, but evolution is not. There were, however, unexpected complications. Ruth came back to Tel Aviv with uncertainty burned out by passion. She knew what she wanted. What she didn't know yet was how to get it. There's this about others. They are not human. It seems a fatuous distinction, a too obvious comment to make. We can make a lifetime of studying others, their makeup, their psychology, but we have nothing to hold on to, nothing to comprehend. We can communicate and do, sometimes. The others need carers in the physicality. They need bodyguards, technicians, women and men to maintain the hardware that they run on and to protect it. All living things need, above all, to survive. Most others never spoke to humanity. They lived in the digitality pursuing whatever it was they pursued, mathematics or God, if the two can even be said to be separate entities. But some were more human-centric, and just as some humans were obsessed with others, so were some others obsessed with humanity. There were factions amongst them. You asked about the children born in Central Station, but not yet. These are the deep mysteries, the secret knowledge. Even the oracle did not know it all. Not then. There are others. And there are others. 
The human faction ran the game's worlds. Some, obsessed with corporeality, body surfed on willing human hosts, seeking shelter in the human form and body, in the rush of hormones, the beat of a heart, the heat of sexual attraction. And others sought an even more intimate knowing, a true joining. A thought that filled Ruth with nervousness and excitement intermingled, that kept her awake in the long summer nights of the Mediterranean, sitting on the beach at midnight with her friend Anat, for she still had friends then, she was not yet the oracle, discussing Martian politics and trade relations with the belt, the ongoing construction of Central Station, tension between the intertwined Israel-Palestine polities, the African refugees still crossing the border in the Sinai and into the country, the immigrant workers still streaming in from Asia to join their families and friends in the old run-down neighborhood of the Central Bus Station, the latest release from Phobos Studios, and the new music coming from the belt, anything and everything. But another? Anat said. She shrugged uneasily and lit a ubique cigarette. The last thing from New Israel on Mars, high-density data encoded in the smoke particles. She inhaled deeply, the data traveling into her lungs, entering the bloodstream and into the brain, an almost immediate rush of pure knowledge. Wow, Anat said and grinned goofily. You know about others, Ruth said. Anat said, you know I worked as a hostess. Yes. Anat made a face. It was odd, she said. You're not really aware when they're body surfing you. They download into your node, controlling your motor functions, getting the sensory feed. While you're somewhere in the conversation, in virtuality, or just nowhere, she shrugged. Asleep, she said. But then, when you wake up, you just feel different. Like, you don't know what they did with your body. They're supposed to keep it healthy unless you get paid extra. I know some of us did, but I never took the money. But you notice little things. Dirt under your left little finger where it hadn't been before. A scratch on your inner thigh. A different perfume. A different cut of hair. But subtle. Almost as if they're trying to play games with you. To make you doubt that you saw anything. To make you wonder what it was you did. Your body did what they did with it. She took a sip of her wine. It was all right, she said, for a while. The money was good, but I wouldn't do it now. Sometimes I'm afraid they can forcibly take me over, break down my node security, take over my body again. They would never, Ruth said, shocked. There are treaties, hard-coded protocols. Oh, sometimes I dream that they enter me, Anat said, ignoring her. I wake up slowly, but I am still dreaming, and I know I am sharing my body with countless others, all watching through my eyes, and I feel their fascination when I move my fingers or curl my lip, but it is a detached sort of interest, the way they would look at any other math problem. They're not like us, Ruth. You can't share with a mind this different. You can be on or off, but you can't be both. There had been a dreamy, detached look in Anat's eyes that night. She had been changed by her contact with the others, Ruth had thought. There was addiction there, a fascination not unlike that some people had with God. They had lost contact at last. Anat had remained human after all, while Ruth... For a time, she had tried religion. It came in capsules, little doses of crucifixion, sold on the streets of the old neighborhood of Central Station. Robotniks had began to appear at that time on the streets, those discarded cyborg soldiers, and the drug had been used to control them, initially when they still served. Now they had taken the means of production on to themselves and sold the excess, or traded it for parts or fuel. You seldom saw a female Robotnik, though they did exist. She had met a nest of them living together in Jerusalem, in the old Russian compound. The Martian colonists had popularized the concept of the nest. Now Earthers replicated them, a social meme, like a virus spreading. 
Ruth took her first hit here, in the Robotnik's junkyard, by fires burning in upturned half-barrels with the stars and the Earth's orbiting settlements shining high above in a dark sky. You know, you've seen the effects of crucifixation. The shining white light that comes down from the sky, the heavens opening, the way you slowly rise into that place where God resides. It gives you faith. It is addictive. But how does it work? Like Ubik, crucifixation is a neurotransmitted viral agent, data encoded into biological particles delivered via the human bloodstream, direct into the brain node interface. For Ruth was a child of the post-Cohen era. She had been hardwired into the conversation, the way earlier children had not been. Her node grew with her, a bio-digital seed planted in a baby's pliant skull, evolving along with the toast. You say parasite, but what is a parasite? Symbiont might be a more accurate description, but really, is a node anything more than an additional sense, another part of the human network? Is a nose a symbiont? Are your eyes? To not be a part of the conversation is to be deaf and dumb and blind. Religion intoxicated Ruth, but only for a little while. Infatuation fades. In the drug, she found no truth that couldn't be found in the guilds of Ashkelon universe or other virtualities. Was heaven real, or was it yet another construct, another virtuality within the conversation's distributed networks of networks? The drug, a trigger. Either way, she thought, it was linked to the others. Eventually, the more time you spent in the virtuality where they lived, everything linked to the others. Without the drugs, she had no faith of her own. Something in her psychological makeup prohibited her from believing. Other humans believed the way they breathed. It came natural to them. The world was filled with synagogues and churches, mosques and temples, shrines to Elron and Ogko. New faiths rose and fell like breath. They bred like flies. They died like species. But they did not reach their ghostly hands to Ruth. Something inside her was lacking. True joinings were rare at that time. Today we breed sub-others in our breeding grounds, embedding human-centric personalities in our appliances, our coffee makers and refrigerators and waste disposal units. You may have heard of the one called Shoot on Mars, who wrote a novel called Waste a metaphysical detective novel about the nature of life and waste that featured Smeg, the detective. This was in the time Dr. Novum was rumored to have come back from the stars. But this is not their story. This is the story of Ruth, who had become the oracle and of her progenitor, St. Cohen of the Others. And so at last Ruth traveled to Jerusalem, to the shrine where the original breeding grounds once lay in splendid isolation. Nazis out! Nazis out! Five months later, and it was happening again. The villagers with pitchforks and burning torches. Balaz called them. The protesters were diffuse but globally organized. They had pursued the research team across each hastily abandoned location, but here, in Jerusalem, the plight of the Ur creatures tapped in the prison of the closed network of the breeding grounds raised public sympathies to a new level. Matt wasn't sure why. The Vatican had lodged an official complaint with the Israeli government. The Americans offered tacit support but said nothing in public. The Palestinians condemned what they called Zionist digital aggression. Vietnam offered shelter, but Matt knew they were already working on their own researchers. Vietnamese dolls made their commercial debut two decades later, eventually exported en masse across the fledgling colonies of the solar system. The entity known as Dragon, perhaps the strangest of the physical, fascinated of the others, famously used tens of thousands of them as worker ant bodies when it colonized the moon Hydra. Nazis! Nazis! Destroy the concentration camp! Oh, assholes, Fury said. 
They were watching out the window, a nondescript building in the new part of town but close to the old city. The demonstrators waved placards and marched up and down as media reps filmed them. The lab building itself was heavily protected against intrusion, both physical and digital. It was as if they were under siege. Matt just couldn't understand it. Did they not read? Did they not know what would happen if the project was successful, if a true digital intelligence emerged, and if it then managed to escape into the wider world of the digitality? Countless horror films and novels predicted the rise of the machines, the fall of humanity, the end of life as we know it. He was just taking basic precautions. But the world had changed since the paranoid days of big oil and visible chipsets, of American ascendancy and DNS root servers. It was a world in which the conversation had already began, that whisper and shout of a billion feeds all going on at once, a world of solar power and RLVs, a world in which Matt's research was seen as harking back to older, more barbaric days. They did not fear for themselves, those protesters. They feared for Matt's subjects, for these in potentia babies forming in the breeding grounds, assembling lines of codes the way a human baby forms cells and skin and bones, becoming set them free the banners proclaimed and a thousand campaigns erupted like viral weed in the still primitive conversation the attitude to matt's digital genetics experiments was one reserved for stem cell research or cloning or nuclear weapons and meanwhile within the closed network of processing power that was the breeding grounds the others carefully made unaware of the happenings outside continued to evolve there can be no evolution without mutation, Tiros wrote, and so with each evolutionary cycle changes are made. They are minute. An and is changed to an or, thus shutting down an entire branch, or activating another previously dormant, or the condition of an if statement is very slightly changed. Successful trees reproduce. With each cycle they exchange and add branches, and create new entities that combine branches from previous progenitors. In each cycle the structures are weighed and scored. Only the fittest survive. Ruth walked into the shrine. The old lab building had always meant to be only a temporary house for the research, but this was where it had happened, at last, where the barrier was breached and the alien entities trapped inside the network finally spoke. Imagine the first words of an alien child. Ironically, there is confusion as to what they had actually said. The records have been lost, misplaced, let us say. And so we don't know for certain. In his book, Tiroche claims their first words communicated to the watching scientists and trilingual scripts on the single monitor screen were stop breeding us in the later martian biopic of matt cohen the rise of others the words are purported to be set us free according to fieri in his autobiography they were not words at all but a joke in binary what the joke was he did not say some argue that it was What's the difference between 00110110 and 00100110? The answer? 11001011, but that seems unlikely. Ruth walked through the shrine. The old buildings had been preserved, the same old obsolete hardware on display humming theatrically, the cooling units and the server arrays, the flashing lights of Ethernet ports and other strange devices. But now flowers grew everywhere, left in pots on windowsills and old desks, on the floor, and amidst them candles burned, and incense sticks, and little offerings of broken machines and obsolete parts rescued from the garbage. Pilgrims walked reverently around the room. A Martian reborn with her red skin and forearms, a robo-priest with the worn skin of old metal, humans of all shapes and sizes. Iban from the belt and lunar Chinese. 
tourists from Vietnam and France and from nearby Lebanon, their media spores hovering invisibly in the air around them, the better to record the moment for posterity. Ruth just stood there, in the hushed semi-dark of the old abandoned grounds, trying to imagine it the way it was, to see through Matt Cohen's eyes. She wondered what the others had said that first time, what message of peace or acrimony they had delivered, what plea. Mother, Balaz claimed in his own autobiography, published only in Hungarian, had been their first word. Everyone had their own version, and perhaps it was that the others had spoken to all present in the language and manner which they understood. Ruth, at that moment, realized that she wanted to know the truth of that instance in time, and what the others had really said, and that there was only one way to do it, and so she left the shrine with the sense of things unfinished, and went outside and returned to Tel Aviv. But the answers could not be found there, but a nearby in Jaffa. There had always been an oracle living in Jaffa. You had heard of Ibrahim, he who was called the Lord of Discarded Things, head of the junkman's Lishana, or Legion, or Guild. Ibrahim was a mystery, not joined, not a robotnik either, and yet his lifespan exceeded that of an unmodified human. Who was he? Stories of a man like Ibrahim had circulated in Jaffa for centuries, going back to the pre-digital age. An ageless man, the wandering Arab of legend. And thus, too, in the shadow of the old city which had stood on top of the hill for untold centuries, in the shadow of the place where once a fort of the Egyptian empire resided in splendor, and where successive invasions came and went like the waves of the Mediterranean on the shore below, there had always been an other Jaffa, a shadow city, an underworld. Ruth came on foot from the direction of the beach at twilight. She climbed the hill and went into the cobbled narrow streets up and down stone stairways and into an alcove of cool stone and shade. She did not know what to expect. As she stepped into the room, the conversation ceased around her abruptly, and in the silence of it she felt afraid. Come in, the voice said. It was the voice of a woman, not young, not old. Ruth stepped in, and the door closed behind her, and there was nothing. It was as if the world of the conversation, the world of the digitality, had been erased. She was alone in base reality. She shivered. The room was unexpectedly cool. As her eyes adjusted to the dim light, she saw an ordinary room filled with mismatched furniture, as though it had been supplied wholesale from Ibrahim's junkyard. In the corner sat a conch. Oh, Ruth said. Child, the voice said, and there was laughter in it. What did you expect? I... I am not sure what I was expecting. I... I am not sure I was expecting anything. Oh, then you won't be disappointed, the conch said reasonably. You are a conch. You are observant. Ruth bit back a retort. She approached cautiously. May I? she said. Satisfy your curiosity? Yes, by all means. Ruth approached the conch. It looked like an immersion pod, the sort you get in virtuality rent halls, the sort gamers and deep immersion users hired by the day or the week. But it was different, too. Conchs are rare. In a way, they are obsolete, like robotnics or body external nodes. They are not a true joining, a merging of human and other. Rather, they are a self-imposed permanent immersion in the conversation, an augmentation. Ruth ran her hand softly over the slightly warm face of the conch, its smooth surface growing transparent. She saw a body inside, a woman suspended in liquid. The woman's skin was pale, almost translucent. Wires ran out sockets in her flesh and into the shielding of the conch. The woman's hair was white, her skin smooth, flawless. She seemed ethereal to Ruth, and beautiful, like a tree or a flower. The woman's eyes were open and a pale blue, but they did not look at Ruth. 
The eye saw nothing in the human perceived spectrum of light. None of the woman's senses worked in the conversational sense. She existed only in the conversation, her softwared mind housed in the powerful platform that was her body conk interface. She was blind and deaf and yet she spoke, but Ruth realized she did not hear the woman's voice in her ears at all. She heard it through her node. Yes, the woman said, as though understanding Ruth's thought processes, which Ruth realized the conk was probably analyzing in real time as she stood there. The conk waited. And encouraging her. Ruth closed her eyes, concentrated. The room was shielded, firewalled, blocked to the conversation. Wasn't it? Faintly, as she concentrated, she could feel it, though, putting the lie to her assumption, like a high tone almost beyond the range of human ears to hear. Not a silence at all, but a compressed shout. The impossibly high bandwidth of the others, what they called an asteroid pigeon. The Tok Tok blog, Narawan. The conversation of others. It was as if it were not the conch but herself who was deaf and blind, that she could try helplessly to listen to that level of conversation going on above her head in some impossible language, some impossible speed not meant for human consumption. Such a concentration was like swallowing a thousand crucifixation pills, like spending years within the guilds of Ashkelon virtuality as if they were a single day. She wanted it suddenly and achingly, the want you get when you can't have something precious. Are you willing to give up your humanity? The conch said. What is your name? Ruth said, asking the woman who was the conch, the conch who had been a woman. I have no name, the conch said, no name you'd understand. Are you willing to give up your name, Ruth Cohen? Ruth stood suspended in indecision. Would you give up your humanity? Matt stared at the screen. He felt the ridiculous need to shout, It's alive! It's alive! The way they did indeed portray him in that Phobos Studios biopic two centuries later. But of course he didn't. Fury and Balaz looked at him with uncertain grins. First contact, Balaz breathed. Imagine meeting an alien species for the first time. What do you say to them? That you are their jailer? It was as if sound had left the room, a bubble of silence, suddenly breaking. What was that? Fury said. There were shrill whistles and shouted chants breaking in even through the soundproofing, and then he could hear the unmistakable sound of gunshots. The protesters, Balaz said. Matt tried to laugh it off. They won't get in, will they? We should be fine. And them, Balaz said, indicating the network of humming computers and the soul screen and the words on it. Shut them down, Fury said suddenly. He sounded drunk. We could suspend them, Balaz said, until we know what to do, put them to sleep. But they're evolving, Matt said. They're still evolving. They will evolve until the hardware runs out of room to host them, Bala said. Outside, there were more gunshots and the sound of a sudden explosion. We need more hosting space. He said it calmly, almost beatifically. If we release them, they will have all the space they need, Fury said. You're mad. We must shut them down. This is what we worked for. There was the sound of the downstairs door breaking open. They looked at each other, shouts from downstairs from some of them, other research people, turning into screams. Surely they can't. Matt wasn't sure later who'd said that. And all the while the words hung on the screen, mute and accusing. The first communication from an alien race, the first words of Matt's children. He opened his mouth to say something he wasn't sure later what it would have been. Then the wave of protesters poured into the room. No, Ruth said. No, the conch said. No, Ruth said. 
She already felt regret, but she pushed on. I would not give up my humanity for... for... She sighed. For the mysteries, she said. She turned to leave. She wanted to cry, but she knew she was right. She could not do this. She wanted to understand, but she wanted to be, too. Wait, the conch said. Ruth stopped. What, she said. That was the right answer, the conch said. Ruth turned. What? Do you think I am inhuman, the woman and the conch said. Yes, Ruth said. No, I don't know she said at last, and waited. The conch laughed. I'm still human, it said. Oh, how human. We cannot change what we are, Ruth Cohen. If that was what you wanted, you would have left disappointed. We can evolve, but we are still human, and they are still other. Maybe one day. But she did not complete the thought, Ruth said. You mean you can help me? I am ready, child, the oracle said, to die. Does that shock you? I am old, my body fails. To be translated into the conversation is not to live forever. What I am will die. A new me will be created that contains some of my code. What will it be? I don't know. Something new and other. When your time comes, that choice will be yours, too. But never forget, humans die. So do others. Every child, they are changed and reborn. The only rule of the universe, child, is change. You are dying? Ruth said. She was still very young then, you must remember. She had not seen much death yet. We are all dying, the oracle said. But you are young and want answers. You will find, I am afraid, that the more you know, the less answers you have. I don't understand. No, the oracle said. You do not. Matt was pushed and shoved and went down on his ass, hard. They streamed in. They were mostly young, but not all. They were Jews and Palestinians, but also foreigners. The media attention had brought them over from India and Britain and everywhere else, wealthy enough to travel, poor enough to care. The world's middle-class revolutionaries, the Ching Ching Ches. Don't, don't! Matt shouted, but they were careful, he saw, and for a moment he didn't understand. They were not destroying the machines, they were making sure to remove people aside to form a barrier around the machines and the power supplies and the cooling units. And then they... He shouted, No! And he tried to get up, but hands grabbed him and personally, a girl with dreadlocks and a boy with a Che t-shirt. They were not destroying the machines, they were plugging in. They had brought mobile servers with them, wireless broadcast, portable storage units, an entire storage and communication network, and they were plugging it all into the secured closed network. They were opening up the breeding grounds. The conch wheeled outside and Ruth followed. The conversation opened up around her, the noise of a billion feeds all vying for attention at once. Ruth followed the conch along the narrow roads until they came to the old neighborhood of Ajami. Children ran after them and touched the surface of the conch. It was night now, and when they reached Ibrahim's junkyard, torches were burning, and they cast the old junk in an unearthly glow. A new moon was in the sky. Ruth always remembered that later. The sliver of a new moon, and she looked up and imagined the people living there. Ibrahim met them at the entrance. Oracle, he said, nodding. And you are Ruth Cohen. Yes. Ruth said, surprised. I am Ibrahim. She shook hands awkwardly. Ibrahim held her hand and opened it. He examined it like a surgeon. Adjoining is not without pain, he said. Ruth bit her lip. I know, she said. 
You are willing? Yes. Then come. They followed him through the maze of junk, of old petrol cars and giant fish refrigeration units, and industrial machines and piles of discarded paper books, and mountains of broken toys, and the entire flotsam and jetsam of obsoleteness. Within this maze of junk there was, at its heart, a room whose walls were junk and whose roof was the stars. There was an old picnic table there, and a medical cabinet and a folding chair. Please, Ibrahim said, sit down. Ruth did. The conch had wheeled itself with difficulty through the maze and now stood before her. Ibrahim, the conch said. Yes, he said. And he went into the junk and returned, and in his hands he was holding a towel, and he unfurled it carefully, almost reverently. Inside it were three golden, prosthetic thumbs. Oh, Ruth said. It was conducted in silence. She remembered that, too. Nothing spoken but the sound of the waves in the distance, and the sound of children playing in the neighborhood beyond, and the smell of cooking lamb and of cardamoms and cumin. Ibrahim brought forth a syringe. Ruth put her arm on the table. Ibrahim cleaned her skin where the vein was and injected her. She felt the numbness spread. He took her hand and laid it, splayed flat on the table. In the torchlight, his face looked aged and hurting. He took a cleaver, an old one. It must have belonged to a butcher in the market down the hill long ago. Ruth looked away. Ibrahim brought the cleaver down hard and cut off her thumb. Her blood sprayed the picnic table. Her thumb fell to the ground. Ruth gritted her teeth as Ibrahim took one of the golden prosthetic thumbs and connected it to Ruth's flesh. White bone was jutting out of the wound. She forced herself to look. Now, Ibrahim said. The protesters plugged into the network Matt saw lights flashing, the transfer of an enormous amount of data, like huge shapes pushing through a narrow trough as they tried to escape. He closed his eyes. He imagined for just a moment that he could actually hear their sound as they broke free. She was everywhere and nowhere at once. She was Ruth, but she was someone, something else, too. She was a child, a baby, and there was another, an other, entwined into her, a twin. Together they existed in a place that had no physicality. They were evolving together, mutating and changing, lines of code merging into genetic material, forming something, someone, new. When it was done, when the protesters left, or had been arrested by the police, after he had finished answering questions, dazed, and wandered outside and into the media spotlight, and refused to answer questions. You can view the historical footage at your leisure. He went into a bar and sat down and watched the television as he drank. He was just a guy who tried to create something new. He had never meant for the world to be changed. He drank his beer, and a little later he felt the weariness fall from him, a sense of release, of the future dissipating. He was just a guy drinking beer in a bar, and as he sat there, he saw a girl at another table, and their eyes met. He wasn't then St. Cohen of the others. He wasn't yet a myth, not yet portrayed in films or novels, not yet the figurehead of a new faith. The others were out there, in the world, somewhere. What they would do or how, he didn't know. He looked at the girl, and she smiled at him. And sometimes, that is all there is, and must be enough. She stood up and went to her and asked if he could sit down. She said yes. He sat down, and they talked. She emerged from the virtuality years or decades later, or it could have just taken a moment. When she, they, looked down at her, their hand, she, they, saw the golden thumb and knew it was it, them. 
Beside her, the conch was still, and she knew the woman inside it was dead. Through her node, she could hear the conversation, but above it, she could hear the talk talk blong narawan, not clear yet, and she knew it never will be, not entirely, but she could at least hear it now, and she could speak it haltingly. She was aware of others floating in the virtual, in the digitality. Some circled around her curious, many others distant in the webs were uninterested. She called into the void, and a voice answered, and then another, and another. She, they, stood up. Oracle, Ibrahim said. This story was originally published in Analog Science Fiction and Fact, September 2013. This story couldn't come at a better time. For those familiar with the news, Elon Musk has been warning governments and people alike about the dangers of creating an AI or an alien race, as Lavi puts it in his story, that is capable of taking over. But I don't think in Lavi's story, at least in this little chunk, because I know this is part of a larger universe for Lavi, the new species that is created in this story do not come across as nefarious or evil or hell-bent on taking over humanity, although I do have one thought on that. There will be a point in Lavi's universe where humans are overwritten, and we've seen it before in a lot of science fiction, where when humans are indelibly changed and rewritten and evolved over and over and over and over and over again, can you really call them human? Anyway, this story will stick with me. What about you? What are your thoughts on the story? You can leave us a comment or a question at the Clark Schuld Magazine website itself, or you can go to the About Us page where all of our contact information is listed. I do hope, since this being the last story for July, you come back in August for a whole new slate of stories. And until then, I bid you a very fond and warm a revoir, a piento, adieu, aloha, and every other word that means please come back and listen again very, very soon. And until then, and the new month rolls around, I do hope that you are well.